So I'm going to speak about the uh, inverse problems for Einstein equations and also nonlinear hyperbolic equations, in particular for wave equation. And the results are in, done in collaboration with Jaroslav Kurile, Lauri Oksanen, Günther Ullmann, and Yiran Wang. So the, um, we will consider uh, inverse problems for wave equations that have some non, non have some nonlinearity. Like here, we have a linear wave operator, and then we have added there a nonlinear term. Uh, and then we are considering inverse problems for active measurements. We have a source f that produces waves. Our, we, are, we are going to use um, the new principle that the nonlinearity like this equation, so on this quadratic term, it is, it is not a difficult term that we should get, get rid of, but it helps uh, solving inverse problems. We are going to use the nonlinearity to create interaction of waves. For instance, in this, this uh, uh, video here, we, are going, uh, we have uh, four waves that are propagating, and when they start to interact, they will create uh, an artificial point source that sends information to all directions in space. And this is what we are going to use as, as an advantage to solve inner problems. But we are going to uh, uh, use the redu reduction of this active inverse problem to passive inverse problem. So in active inverse problems, like in, in this picture, there is some source that sends waves to unknown object. And in passive um, inverse problems, we are not controlling the sources, but we are just observing them. So we are going to reduce the active inverse problem, active measurement inverse problem to passive inverse problem. And this is already a topic that Günther Ullmann spoke about, but let me recall the results from a little bit uh, different point of view. For the passive um, uh, observations, we consider the following problem. Let's assume that uh, there is some, some portion of the space-time U that contains a large number of point sources. We observe the light that comes from these point sources and observe it in different set. Uh, can we find the structure of the space-time in the set that contains the point sources? So more precisely, we are considering the case when the space-time looks like this, that there is a set U here that contains a, a dense set of point sources. They send, they send light, so like here we have this point source at point Q, it sends the light that propagates in a light cone, and we observe that in set V. V is here some open set. And we assume that the geometry looks like in this picture. Um, we assume that, the, that the, all these light, light sources, these points Q, they, they sense different type of light. For instance, they have a slightly different color, so that we can separate uh, light coming from one point source and from another. And we are going to show that this type of, of observations, they determine this uh, unknown portion of the manifold, this U, uh, as a differentiable manifold. We can detect its differentiable structure, which means topology and differentiable coordinates. And we can also reconstruct the metric up to a scalar factor. To consider this problem, let me define uh, some notations. Uh, so manifolds, uh, Lorentzian manifolds are denoted by M and metric G. Uh, geodesics that start from point X to direction Xi are denoted by gamma X Xi. We have the standard definition to time-like and light-like -like vectors. And I denote the uh, future light cone of, at the point. So we are in tangent space. We are, have point X. We look at the tangent space. All future pointing light-like vectors. The set of those is denoted by L plus X at M. Then the causal future of a point P is denoted by J plus of P. And the causal past of a point P is also J minus uh, of, of, of P. So this consists of, contains all points on the manifold that are in causal past of point P. We use uh, the standard definition that we assume that the manifold is globally hyperbolic. I recall the definition. So there are no closed causal curves, so no, no time traveling. And then all diamond sets that are intersections of a, a future of point P1, like here, and, um, and the uh, past of point P2, 
these diamond sets are assumed to be compact. And in this case, we can represent the manifold as a product uh, of, of time axis and space. And in inverse problems, we often consider that we say that we actually have a, a time-depending metric um, on a space n. So these are the basic definitions. A little bit, little bit more specific definitions. This is related to uh, passive measurements. So let's assume that we are, the geometry looks like this. So here the set U, where the unknown, uh, that is unknown to us and contains lots of point sources. This is uh, in the past of point P plus, here this corner, upper corner point, but not in the past of P minus. So we have this condition for U. This is that the set that we want to reconstruct. And the data that is observed in set V. And the V consists of a union of time-like curves. For instance, 3D falling observers. We have a family of curves, new A, that are indexed by set A. So this A could, for instance, tell what is the initial point and initial direction of 3D falling observers. And the union of all these paths new A, these are uh, uh, the set V where we do observation. And we specify one uh, path new A0, and it contains this point P minus and P plus. And in, like I explained, U is in the past of P plus, but not in P, uh, past of P minus. Um, so the, um, I often use this kind of science fiction analogies to explain this problem. So we could consider that uh, we have we are doing measurements in the neighborhood of Earth. So Earth corresponds to this uh, time-like curve, new A0. And then we do measurements in the neighborhood, open neighborhood of the of the path of, of Earth in space-time. There are lots of satellites. The satellites are propagating along time-like curves, new A. And the satellites can measure light. And then we assume that we are observing some distant um, uh, area of the universe, let's say Andromeda. And there are lots of point sources, like varying stars or some other point sources. And for each point source, we can measure when a satellite, the path mu A, when it gets a first observation, when light from Q is observed at point mu A. These are called observation time functions. So these functions f q, they are related to point source q. If you want to look really at science fiction analogy, let's think that we are doing measurements very, very long time, and these point sources are like supernovas or novas just. And the nova sends light, and we are observing it in neighborhood of Earth. And this function f q of a, this is the time when the observer on the path new A observes light coming first time from point Q. So that is the uh, smallest value of S, so that there is a light-like geodesic directed to the future, that uh, light ray from Q to path new A. So we have point sources. These functions tell what is the first time when we see light at single path coming from point Q. And Günther Ullmann already talked about this result. It is that when we do, do these measurements on a globally hybrid manifold, if we are uh, if we uh, uh, know the set V, the set V here, uh, and we, the, we know how to parameterize it as, as using these paths mu A's, then uh, so uh, let's assume we know V and the, uh, the metric on, on set V. So we know the metric close to Earth. Then then we observe. Uh, uh, light uh, coming from point sources in some distant galaxy, this set U, we take the collection of all these time observation functions. They are a subset of continuous functions on the index set of this path. This determines the topology of this set U, also with different coordinates or atlas of coordinates, up to change of coordinates, of course. And then we can determine the conformal class of the metric G in set, set, set U. So this basically was the topic that, that Günther Ullmann was speaking about. This is really associated, associated to passive observations. Then we have lots of, lots of point sources that emit light. 
Next, we are going to go to inverse problems where we do active measurements. We have wave equation and we have sources. And we are going to reduce this to the passive measurement inverse problem. Later, we go to Einstein's scalar field equations. But it is simpler to explain this ideas to wave equations. So let me start from that. So first, some classical results for inverse problems for linear equations. Uh, just for Euclidean Laplacian plus Q, uh, Sylvester, Ullman, and Nachman, they were considering a spectral problem that is in, equivalent to inverse problem for wave equation. For 90s, uh, Belisha, Kurilev, and Tataru, they were able to show that the Riemannian manifold with time independent metric can be reconstructed from, from local measurements. And but these results use very heavily Tataru's unique continuous result that is known to be uh, not valid when the coefficients are dependent on time and are not real analytic. They are Allen Hack's counter examples for unique continuous for wave equation. This kind of techniques for linear wave equation, they have pushed all the way by asking to wave equation with a time depending metric that is real analytic in the time variable. And I also want to emphasize that when we consider time depending systems, then we, uh, it's difficult to pair from measurements many times, but you, there are methods to pack many measurements to single measurement for wave equation. Okay, this pair for the linear equations. And the message here is that when you have time depending system, it's very difficult to solve inverse problems. Now for nonlinear equations, we can solve the problem. So nonlinearity helps in the sense that for linear equations, uh, there are problems that are still open, but we can solve those to nonlinear equations. Namely, when we have a nonlinear equation uh, of, of quite general, then we can uh, construct um, the, 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 uh, the metric if it is uh, depending on time variables. So here is the result for wave equation. We proved the uh, uh, reconstruction of conformal structure by, with Kurilev and, and, and Ullmann, and the data with Ullmann and Wang at the conformal factor can be constructed. So let us consider a globally hyperbolic manifold, M, of dimension 4. We consider a nonlinear wave equation that has the linear wave operator plus nonlinearity due to power M, where M is at least 2. So that this is a genuinely nonlinear equation. We assume that we do measurements uh, close to the uh, time like curve u in its neighborhood b. And there are two points p1 and p2. And we want to reconstruct the space time in the causal diamond associated to points p1 and p2. So let's again look at science fiction analogy. We have a spaceship that is, uh, wants to somehow look what's around it. And that's active measurements. It does active measurements in a small neighborhood of space time along its path. So mu is the path in space time of a spaceship, v is its neighborhood. The spaceship uses active measurements, so it can introduce small sources f that sends waves. The waves propagate far away and they need to re return back to the close to the spaceship, and then we can detect those. This is modeled by the source to solution map that takes a small source f supported in z3 and maps that to the restriction of the solution uh, in v. So we produce sources close to mu and observe waves close to uh, also close to mu. And now the source to solution map, and actually so we now assume that we know both the neighborhood v and then the source to solution map defined for sources and observations in V, is determine this causal diamond set. Uh, future of P1 intersected with future, uh, the past of P2. And in this set, we can reconstruct the conformal, we can reconstruct this causal diamond, we can reconstruct the conformal class of the metric on it. And also, if the power of the nonlinearity is not three, then we can reconstruct the whole uh, metric density. I want to emphasize that even though this, in this picture, the geometry looks very simple, the topology of, of this causal diamond can be non-trivial. So this is the problem that we studied for a scalar wave operator. 
let me formulate a similar type of problem for Einstein and scalar field equations. And here the idea would be that we, for instance, have a complicated space-time, like for instance, with some wormhole, and we want to reconstruct uh, uh, structures in this space-time. Okay, let me fix the system. So for uh, we used the sign convention minus uh, plus 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 the Lorentzian matrix, and we considered the Einstein equations with the uh, stress energy tensor T. Here is the Einstein the required record of the Einstein tensor. And the wave coordinates, Einstein equation yields two equations. One is a nice hyperbolic equ uh, equation that is nonlinear. And then we have a conservation law that the divergence of the stress energy tensor has to be zero. And this divergence condition causes some problems, as I will explain. But this equation is very nice because it is quasi-linear uh, wave operator. And we now know that the nonlinearity helps in solving inverse problems. So we want to use the nonlinearity of Einstein equations as a tool to solve uh, the inverse problem. OK, one more thing. To make active measurements, we have to add something else than just uh, metric. We have to add matter fields. And uh, in this talk, we have added uh, several scalar fields that we couple together with Einstein field equations. So the metric satisfies the Einstein equation. Einstein uh, tensor is, is, is stress density tensor T. And this T contains two parts. It is a couple, usual coupling of, 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 of metric and scalar fields. I have now capital L scalar fields. And then I add there some source term that is produced by some other physical term. Then I couple this with the scalar fields. So we have linear equations for scalar fields. And those also, also have some sources. So I have two types of sources. One type of sources that I add in Einstein equations and other type of sources that I add in scalar fields. And we assume that we have some background metrics that we want to reconstruct. We have a metric G hat and, and scalar field phi hat. They satisfy this coupled Einstein field uh, and scalar field equations with zero sources. So they are quite, quite somehow classical object study in relativity. Just scalar fields and, and Einstein equations that satisfy coupled equations, there are no sources. And then to do measurements, I want to add there some sources. And then we have the difficulty that uh, to have a physically meaningful model, the stress energy tensor is coupling ball phase T plus this F1, those have to satisfy a conservation law. The divergence associated to metric G uh, has to vanish. And here is now the main difficulty. It is that if I add there some source, this changes the metric, and this change of metric changes the requirement that the sources have to satisfy. So it is difficult to say that what are the sources that uh, I can use that are physically realistic so that they satisfy the conservation law, because when I introduce a source, this changes the conservation law. How to get uh, uh, rid of this problem, or how to solve this problem? So let's add a little bit conditions for the matter series. I recall that we had a time like geodesy, new, and we, it's neighborhood V where we do measurements. And this area, this is the area where we are introducing sources. And there we, in this area, we require that the background scalar fields that, that, that are there without any sources, they vary enough. So at each point X of the neighborhood V, this four times four matrix, the derivative of the background scalar fields is inevitable. And now we are want to ask, ask the following question. Assume that we have this condition A, that the background fields vary. Then we do measurements that are analogous to a source to solution map uh, 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 with sources and observations in set B. We ask, does this determine the manifold and the metric in this causal diamond, in the area where the waves can propagate far away and return back to the area where the observation. And to study this question, we have to guarantee that the condition, that this conservation law is valid, this needs to be valid for all solutions 
of the Einstein scalar field equation. How to do this type of somehow satisfy this type of requirement? So we can formulate the direct problem. Just the, the model it can be formulated by using some additional sources that I call secondary sources. So let's assume now that we add into Einstein equations source term p. And then we have the scalar, scalar fields, its source is S, and the S consists of part Q. These P's and Q's, I call them primary source. This is something that I introduce. And then I add there some secondary source that depends on all other fields. This is typically small. And we need to construct the secondary sources in such a way that the conservation law, the divergence of T is zero. This is satisfied to all solutions of this system. Uh, so two remarks. First is that what these secondary sources are. They can correspond uh, to model of a measurement device. Namely, if I would consider a much more simpler system, I would just consider a physical system where the total energy is conserved. If I then want to add some sources, the sources put some energy to the system. I have to take the energy from somewhere so that the total energy of the system is conserved. So I have to take the energy from the scalar fields. And this is the idea of what happens. These secondary sources and these primary sources, they uh, uh, model some measurement device. The measurement device will implement the primary sources. And to take the energy and momentum to do that, they, they take some like energy from the scalar fields. And the idea is that uh, we can construct these secondary sources, assuming that the condition A is valid. So we need to require that the, uh, actually if we can show that if the uh, background fields vary enough, then we can use those to uh, construct secondary sources. And the secondary sources are, 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 are uh, obtained by solving point-wise linear equations. So this also somehow could somehow tell that how they could model some measurement. Okay, so this is the setting of the direct problem. How to define the data set? Before we go to the definition of the data set, let us consider the following difficult. Let's assume that we have a freely falling observer uh, that propagates in, in, without any sources along this first the straight line and then the dotted line, so straight line. And we do measurements in a neighborhood of it, and we use Fermi coordinates of this freely falling particle. Then we implement any source, the metric will change. Then the path of the freely falling uh, particle changes, like in this curve, this red curve here. This is the new path when we have changed the metric. So if there would be, if we would have a spaceship that would do measurements, the red. A uh, line is that uh, where the spaceship is traveling in the space time, then we implement some measurements. The measurements change the line, the, the metric, and then the space time has a, has a new road. But anyway, we can specify nicely observations and sources, in the Fermi coordinates associated to this freely falling object. So, what is the data set? The data set consists of the sources in the Fermi coordinates. So when we have some solution of Einstein scalar field equations, there is some metric, and we consider Fermi coordinates in this metric. We represent the source F in these Fermi coordinates. Uh, and then also we consider the solutions of the Einstein scalar field equations. The solutions are the scalar fields and the metric. We represent also the, the metric and the scalar fields in this same uh, uh, same um, Fermi coordinates. So the data set consists of the, of the following family. We have any small source that is supported in a neighborhood of, 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 of this red path. Then we, are, we have a uh, version that the source is small. We assume that the Einstein equations have a solution uh, such that the uh, conservation law is valid. And for all these type of solutions, we uh, record the sources and the solutions in Fermi coordinates. 
Unfortunately, this definition is a little complicated. It is just because when we implement any measurements, the space time is changing. So formulating the measurements in a neighborhood of a freely falling particle is a little bit cumbersome. But this can be considered that this is very closely related to a short solution map, where we map F source to the solution. This is very similar to the graph of the source to solution map. Pairs of sources, and uh, so, so there are pairs of solutions and sources. Okay, so I hope that this, um, even though it's a little complicated, it makes, makes physically sense that uh, we say that we have some coordinate system associated to freely falling uh, geodesic. And in this neighborhood, in Fermi coordinates, we describe sources and solutions that can be observed. Okay, what is the result? The result is that if you have two uh, uh, four dimensional globally hyperbolic Florentia manifolds, so we have this also this metric G hat, which means that it is a background metric. It satisfies the metric G hat and the scalar field pi hat. They satisfy the Einstein scalar field equations with zero sources. And we want to reconstruct the background metric by small by making small two elevations. We assume that the background fits be right, that we have the condition A is valid. Then if we have um, on both manifolds, we have a freely falling, uh, sorry, we have a freely falling object, a time-like geodesic, and we specify two points on this geodesic. And we do measurements in the neighborhood of this freely falling geodesic new I hat. Then uh, for the scale, scalar, field, uh, sorry, for the Einstein scalar field equations, with sources, we, rec we define the data sets. If the data sets coincide, so all observations of, of all possible observations of, of sources and, and, and solutions, if they coincide, then these two manifolds have to be uh, very similar in, in the causal neighborhood. Uh, actually, in these diamond sets, so we have uh, in the, we, we consider now the measurements in this set B here, and we have a larger causal diamond. The result is that when we two, if two manifolds have the same data sets, then they have to iso be isometric in this causal diamond. So there is a diffeomorphism that maps the causal diamond on manifold one to causal diamond of manifold two, so that the metric tensors. Uh, uh, coincide. So this psi has to be isometric between causal diamond. So this means that uh, uh, if you consider uh, globally hyperbolic Lorentzian manifolds, we consider their Einstein scalar field systems, then if the uh, data sets, that is the graphs of the source to solution maps, coincide, then these causal diamonds have to be isometric. So this is combination of results done by Kurilev, Oxen, and Ullmann, and Ullmann and Wang. Let me shortly describe the ideas of, of, of proofs. So let me consider a, a, a nonlinear uh, wave equation with a nonlinearity. We have a non-vanishing smooth function times quadratic nonlinearity. Uh, probably in this conference, you are much more familiar with um, the Einstein. Sorry, with this type of like Lorentz annotations, in inverse problems conference, we always speak about uh, wave equations with time varying metric, because this is something that could be applied in, in medical imaging. So this is the system that we consider. I recall that we consider a source to solution map. We have a, this open set V that is neighborhood of one, one, one time like curve. And then we consider neighborhood of zero functions of smooth functions supported in set V. And for those sources, we define the source to solution map that maps the source F to restriction of solution in V. Okay. So uh, how the nonlinearity helps? We're actually using something that could be called nonlinear geometrical optics. We are going to use um, uh, this kind of ansatz for solutions. That depends on, the, on, on, on different powers of epsilon. And then I block this uh, ansatz to nonlinear wave equation. 
I consider the epsilon, all terms having uh, coefficient epsilon one. Then I get the linearized uh, solutions. So when Q is the inverse of linear wave operator, is W1, this is just the uh, uh, source F1. So the sources are Fs are small parameter epsilon times F1. So this first order, the co co coefficients W1, they are in, uh, I take a source F1 and operate with the inverse of wave operator. So these are linearized waves. Here we have that the linearized wave is interacting with itself, this produces a source. We call these actually artificial sources because they are not really physical sources, but sources created by the nonlinearity. And then we saw the wave operate. And when we go to higher order terms, then there are more complicated combinations like waves, linearized waves are interacting with itself. They produce a wave. Again, we have another set of waves where wave interacts with itself, produces a wave. And then these two obtained waves interact and produce a wave. And for Einstein equations, actually, this, this um, combination has become quite complicated. What type of sources we are, uh, sorry, what type of waves, linearized waves we are going to use? We just use a, a plain type of waves. So we have, we choose coordinates xj that are such that, uh, sorry, actually, one more thing. And now I explain the idea just in Minkowski space. So we are in standard flat Minkowski space to explain the main, main idea. And we choose their coordinates where the zero sets of the coordinates are light like uh, uh, hyperplanes. And then we consider linearized waves that are the, uh, of the, are the form that we take this uh, xj uh, to, uh, to its positive part to power m. So absolute value, this, this notation here is absolute value of, of m times uh, heavy side function. And one can think of those as a species of plane wave, either as plane waves or species of, of, of spherical waves or something like that. And the idea is that we are going to consider now this in space time. So here is a picture in, 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 in one plus two dimensional space time where time is up and, and spatial variables are, are horizontal variables. The plane waves could be, uh, they, are, they are similar on planes. If I start to intersect these planes, that is where the waves, plane waves interact. And three plane waves interact, so we are considering the intersection of three planes, that is a line. And the main point is that the intersection of, of four planes in four dimensional space time is a single point. This is the reason why we are going to create artificial point sources by using nonlinearity. So how to consider the interaction? So we have used this type of simple model that we consider for a source that depends on two epsilon parameters, epsilon one and epsilon two. And they are, they, we then take a linear combination of source F1 and F2, it is epsilon. But vector epsilon is just, I take all epsilon variables and make them a vector. With these sources, I show the nonlinear wave approach. And then to consider this interaction, I take the solution of the nonlinear wave equation, differentiate it once with respect to each uh, uh, epsilon variable, and evaluate those at zero. Like for instance, this term has this type of formula, and we interpret this that two linearized waves have interacted, they produce an artificial source, and the source produces a wave. But these two interaction waves, they don't produce interesting similarities that would propagate to any new directions. Then when we consider interaction of three waves, so we have now three sources. I take linear combination of three sources with, with small epsilon parameters. I block this to the nonlinear wave equation and I will have some solution u epsilon vector. Then I consider the differentiation of this solution with respect to all of our epsilons and evaluate those when epsilons are zero they start to uh, contain this type of terms. So we have interaction of two waves, they produce a wave that interacts with one. And the interaction in, in Minkowski space would happen now in the intersection of three planes. We have a set K123 that is intersection of all these planes. And this is a line in space time. So what it means, we have a line in space time that physically means that we have a point source that's continuously on. 
and it propagates, uh, it moves in space. So the, it is analogical to, how, to, to a hypersonic airplane that, uh, that travels very fast. And if, it, it, if you have a source in this very fast moving point, this produces a conic wave where geometry is very similar to a shock wave. And this is, at least for me, very interesting that interaction of three waves that creates, creates an artificial point source in space that seems to move very, very fast, but it seems to move faster than the speed of light. Of course, information is not propagating with the speed uh, higher than speed of light, but when we have intersections of plane waves, the intersection point can move very, very fast. And how it looks like, here we have like three plane waves, they are propagating. Now the interaction started, three waves are interacting, interacting, interacting. Now interaction stops and they produce a conic wave that starts to propagate. But the, uh, this is not, of course, not, not a simulation by any, any means of numerical uh, somehow solution. But this is just a, a representation of what, where the singularities are. Uh, where we just consider the geometry where the similarities are. Unfortunately, we don't have any fancy numerical simulations. It would be very nice to see actually this uh, by realization of this by, by finite element methods or, or finite this. So then the interaction of four plane, four waves. Now we have four epsilon parameters and four sources, and we compute this linear combination. We put this into the nonlinear wave equation, solve it, get the solution u epsilon vector. And then we differentiate it respect to all epsilon parameters, evaluate those at epsilon r zero, and get uh, 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 w four. This is the wave that can be taught, in, at least roughly speaking, that this is the interaction of four linearized waves. Interesting uh, interaction happens in the intersection of four planes, that is a point. And we interpret this by saying that when four uh, waves interact, so the, the, support, the similar supports intersect, then we create an artificial point source in space-time, which means that this uh, W4 can be written as a solution of the linear wave equation with source SQ, where SQ is a, a delta distribution, and we operate to that with the pseudo differential operator plus some residual term. So the pseudo differential operators don't change uh, the wavefront, especially if they are elliptic, elliptic. So this is micro locally very similar to a point source. And then we have a residual set that creates uh, some extra waves, but the wavefront set of our residual term is small. So the interaction of four planes, four actually not, not plane waves, four linearized waves creates uh, artificial point sources. And how this now what what type of like, what happens for the geometry? You could think four plane waves that are propagating. So let's see if the time is progressing. Now the interaction of two waves started, nothing interesting happens. Now the interaction of three planes start, they start to create a conic wave, but that's not very interesting. And there is a moment when all four plane waves interact. So the, this waves, four, all four planes are intersected. They create a, a, a point like singularity point uh, that is like delta distribution in space multiplied by the delta distribution in time. And that creates a point source that propagates uh, to this, this creates a point source. This point source creates a spherical wave that propagates to all directions of, 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 of space. So the simulation basically here looks like this that nothing happens very now, something has started to happen. Then there's bang. Space-time point source was created. This bang creates a spherical wave that starts to go to all directions. In space-time, we could think like in this way that we have a four geodesics along which uh, plane waves or distorted plane waves are propagating. When the four geodesics intersect, they create a here a point source that sends waves to all directions. 
In particular, the waves are propagating back to the area with new measurements. And this way, we will reduce this problem to passive measurement problem. So the uh, four interaction of, of, of waves produces a spherical wave uh, uh, emanating from point Q. And this determines the observation time functions. So these were the observation time functions associated to point source at point Q. And in this way, we can reconstruct the conformal structure. And the uh, conformal uh, factor is reconstructed by considering the amplitudes of, of the waves. And here I finish. Thank you very much for your attention.